In this room are three terrorists. Another is seen smiling in this photo of a school class trip. Nothing in these rare images sets the men apart from the people around them. Or hints at the horrifying suicide mission they would one day carry out. In time, their names and faces became known all over the world. They were the leaders of the September 11th hijackers. Four young men who met as students in the German city of Hamburg. While the 9-11 Commission report provides a detailed account of their activities, this program goes further, taking a new and exclusive look into their secretive world. Seen here are some of the terrorists' secret communications, as well as classified documents and interrogation records. This new information paints a startling portrait of the core members of the Hamburg cell, the men responsible for the deaths of nearly 3,000 people. In September 2002, one of those core members, Ramzi bin al Sheib, was captured in Karachi. Following his arrest, bin al Sheib was taken to an undisclosed location and interrogated repeatedly. This confidential US Justice Department document is a record of the secrets he relayed. Bin al Sheib told interrogators how he and three other men followed an underground network of operatives into Pakistan, Afghanistan, and finally into the den of Al Qaeda, where they pledged their loyalty to Osama bin Laden and committed themselves to a suicide mission for the glory of Allah. These are the men of the Hamburg cell. Marwan al Shahi, Ramzi bin al Sheikh, Ziad Jara, and Mohammed Atta. If they were somehow super sophisticated, super intelligent, um, superiorly evil creatures, that'd be better because there aren't very many people like that in the world. But they're just ordinary guys. They're just a bunch of guys. That's what's scary. Other terrorist operatives are known to have worked within their group, but these four men were the nucleus of the secret organization. Their base of operation was here, 54 Marienstrasse in Hamburg. The apartment was sparsely furnished. One of its few concessions to the modern world was a high-speed internet connection. In private conversations, the men called their base Dar el Ansar, the house of the followers. Here, they would watch videotapes of Muslim radicals calling for a holy war against the United States. They referred to the US as America the Satan and the head of the snake. Voices often became so loud, neighbors complained about the noise. The leader of the group was Mohammed Atta. As a child in Cairo, Atta had been raised in a strict and reclusive household. His family had few friends and rarely spoke with neighbors. They were not particularly religious. Atta's father, a lawyer, wanted his children to focus on their education. Atta and his two older sisters were instructed to study diligently 
and were rarely allowed to play. Their walk home from school was timed, so if they weren't home by a certain time, someone would go looking for them. In 1992, Atta arrived in Hamburg to study for his degree in urban planning at the Technical University of Hamburg Harburg. Shortly after his arrival, Atta asked for the location of the nearest mosque. He visited several mosques before finding Al Quds in Hamburg's red light district, on a street known for drug trafficking and prostitution. Atta was a guy who was so repressed that he, you know, he didn't like eating. To walk from the rail station and to pass through this, it must have felt like running a gauntlet. This rare video reveals the private world inside the mosque. You walk into it, and it's a quite warm and friendly place. I mean, it's a, it has a, a, the real sense of a boys' clubhouse. Uh, people embrace, uh, touch cheeks with one another, a smile or warm handshakes. Many of Al Quds members held strict and radical views of Islam. The highly disciplined and serious Atta quickly became a regular visitor to the mosque. Another member of Al Quds was 23 year old Ramzi bin Al Sheib. Bin Al Sheib left his home in Yemen and moved to Germany, taking advantage of its generous welfare benefits. He registered as an asylum seeker and collected a monthly check from the government. Like Atta, Bin Al Sheib became heavily involved with Al Quds. The two men soon formed a small prayer group encouraging their members to follow a fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. Atta challenged himself to live by a rigid code of behavior, saying that he rarely laughed because joy kills the heart. He told a friend once that he was reluctant to all pleasure, which is a striking sentence. He dressed in virtually the same clothes every day. He ate the same food. Uh, as far as anybody knows, he never read for pleasure. He read the Quran. By 1998, Ziad Jarrah had joined their meetings. Jarrah's fun loving personality was in striking contrast to Atta's stern behavior. Jarrah had been raised in a middle class family in Beirut, where he was known for finding the best clubs and bars. Though he came to Germany to study, once there, he quickly fell in love with a young woman named Isil Sengun, the daughter of Turkish immigrants. But like the others, the young playboy soon fell under the spell of radical Muslim teachings. His new religious fervor brought about a change in his relationship with Isil. He often criticized her for wearing clothes he considered revealing and told her he was ashamed of her for drinking alcohol. Yet he never ended the relationship. One of the last to join the group that would one day be called the Hamburg Cell was an easygoing young man named Marwan al Shehi, a native of the United Arab Emirates. Although al Shehi had a harsh interpretation of Islam, he would discuss his militant views with charm and warmth. He sang and laughed uh, songs about joining the jihad, about becoming a martyr. In Arabic, jihad can have two very different meanings, either a personal struggle or a holy war. Increasingly, the young men saw themselves as soldiers of Allah, waiting for a call to arms. On the 7th of August, 1998, their quest gained momentum. Al-Qaeda, under the